。好 ，Get Hard， 我稍后开始今天的倒数。五、四、三、二、一，开始。Welcome to Speak. My name is Get Hard. I am the team leader of Speak. Speak is a partnership initiative of the European Union with China. Its subject is very important. It is about the safety of products made in China and exported to the European single market. We are very grateful to the HQTS Group to conduct this training with the Speak project. It is already the third training with HQTS. And if you are interested in the previous webinars with HQTS and more than 30 further webinars, you can watch these recorded webinars on the Speak website for free. Before we start the training, we have two opening speakers from the European Commission and from HQTS. Let's welcome first Mrs. Orse Chorba, which is counselor. Of Digi Just at the delegation of the European Union in Beijing, and ask her why the EU is funding the Speak project. Orsi, please. Thank you very much, Gerhard. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is a real pleasure to speak to you today. The European Union is funding the Speak project because product safety is essential to protect. Or nearly 500 million EU consumers. The trading good between the EU and China is very large, and many products made in China for the EU market are safe. However, there is still quite a high number of dangerous products circulating and reaching consumers, causing mechanical, chemical, and electric risks. These problems could be avoided by adhering. To the EU product safety rules, the mission of Speak is to explain the essentials of these rules and make it easier for manufacturers and others in the supply chain. I think we have、them. a technical problem. IT interpreters, what shall we do?、Um, I could.、Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Gehad, I can hear you. Can、But、you hear? But it's lost, Orsi. Okay.、Um, I, I think what Orsi wanted to say、um, that. The Speak project is here to make it easier for manufacturers and and others in the supply chain to follow the EU product safety rules. All consumer products for the EU must be safe. In the webinar today, I, our speaker experts will explain about consumer product safety and consumer rights that need to be respected. And that EU product safety rules apply to all commercial practices, including e-commerce.、Um, during today's training, our experts will address frequently asked questions related to the safety of toys. Toys are very special products that need particular attention since they are used by the most vulnerable consumers, children. Toy safety. Is paramount to protect their life and health. And then, Orsi would like that you enjoy the training, and that it will help you to better understand the EU product safety rules for the benefit of children and for the compliance of your business with EU rules. Unfortunately, we have lost Orsi,、uh, but we have always a backup. As you see, we continue, and now I am pleased to welcome Mrs. Betsy Chu, the Vice President of Testing Line for HQTS HQTS Group, for a short short opening address. Betsy, please. 大家好。
，首先很感谢 Osia g i r l h e a d 的介绍，我是来自 HQDS 集团的测试线的 Bessie， 很荣幸我们今天能与 Speak 一起来呃呃主持这样子的一个会议。玩具是我们儿童成长阶段不可或缺的产品。玩具的质量安全是儿童健康成长的重要保障之一，因此，儿童玩具的质量安全是全球重点关注的领域之一。但目前，由于玩具质量安全全国的各国的要求及标准各有差异，玩具质量对不同年龄段的质量的要求的又有不同的差异，而且，玩具的质量安全的标准的要求也不断的更新。中国作为最大的玩具生产国及出口国之一，在玩具质量安全合规方面面临着很大的挑战。作为一家专业的第三方检验检测认证机构 ，HQDS 集团二十多年来，我们一直致力于为客户提供全面有效的产品质量安全合规及提升方案，确保客户的产品能快速的符合市场质量安全法规。行业标准及客户自己的要求，助力企业品牌价值的提升与可持续的发展。呃，我们凭借国际的权威认可资质及优质的服务，深得了客户的信任，并赢得了整个行业的玩具行业的高度认可。呃，我们为儿童玩具行业提供的质量安全方案主要包括。原材料的测试、产品的测试、包装测试、产品检验、产品安全标准解读与培训、产品质量安全的问题分析与解决方案的。那实验室的测试是质量安全方案中最重要的一个环节之一，它包括了大家所知道的物理跟化学测试。那我们目前呃实验室能提供的主要的物理测试范围包括物理机械的、燃烧性的。安全性能的标识类的，还有滥用测试、警告标识、可可溯源标识的测试。呃，另外化学的测试项目基本上是种铅、种铬、可溶出重金属、邻苯二甲酸酯等。以上的测试标准，我们实验室目前能覆盖的是欧洲的标准、美国的标准及中国的及世界其他各地的一些主要的呃儿童玩具标准。呃，我在这里就不再具体的介绍我们技术的一些的标准跟呃技术的呃呃方案。呃，接下来的 speak 的专家应该是会详细的介绍各法规跟对大家有有有价值的信息。以上是我的全部发言内容，感谢各位的聆听，希望我的分享能对大家有所帮助。如果大家有具体的问题，可以随时登录我们的三 w 点 hqds 点 com 联系我们，我们很乐意能为大家解答技术问题。谢谢大家。Thank you very much, Betsy, for this very impressive introduction of HQDS. And I say it, it's so important that organizations like HQDS are engaging in product safety and provide advice to businesses. We will show at the end of the webinar、uh, the contact details of HQDS. In addition,、uh, more in institutions are joining us to provide the great support for this webinar, such as the Management Service Center of Hangzhou Cross-Border E-Commerce Comprehensive Pilot Area, the Chengdu Institute of Standardization, and their partners, and many, many thanks to all these supporting partners. As said before, today our experts will answer frequently asked questions about EU compliance for safe toys. At the end of the webinar, we will invite you to a simple quiz. Your feedback is also the condition to receive a certificate jointly from Speak and HQDS. If you have questions during the presentation, please post these questions in the chat sidebar of your screen. We will try to answer them after the presentations in our Q and A session. Finally, we will provide you with links to further materials prepared by Speak for your follow-up study of these important matters. Now, let's start the training. Today, we have three expert speakers. First, I have the pleasure to invite our key expert, John Lawrence. 
to set the scene by introducing EU product safety in overall and how this relates to consumer protection and consumer rights. John, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. I want to introduce today's webinar by discussing some issues of critical importance in the EU. These issues concern product safety and consumer protection. Product safety and consumer protection are key policy areas and are related to one another. We're going to take a look at how these issues relate and how they help protect consumers from unsafe and dangerous products. By understanding the importance placed on these issues, you will understand how the detail that you will hear about today fits into the EU's overall approach. I'm briefly going to tell you about why product safety matters to the EU, the relationship between that topic and consumer protection, and an introduction to the laws that need to be followed when selling products in the EU, including products sold online. Consumers need the protection of these laws for a number of reasons. Firstly, many potential hazards cannot be determined by a consumer through just looking at a product, for example, harmful chemicals in paint coatings. This becomes even more difficult as products become more complex. Some consumers may require extra protection as they're considered particularly vulnerable. Uh, these can include children and older people. And when products are sold online, consumers don't have the opportunity to examine products before purchase and even carry out even basic, simple checks themselves. Put very simply, products that circulate on the EU market must be safe to use. That's the basic requirement, but this is supplemented by laws <clears throat> dealing with the safety of common consumer product categories such as toys and electrical goods. In addition to these product safety laws, there are laws giving legal rights to consumers which are designed to protect them from potential harm. However, these product safety laws only cover the main requirements referred to as the essential requirements. The detail can be found in technical standards and in particular harmonized standards. It is the relationship between the laws and standards which keeps and helps keep consumers safe. We'll be looking at this in relation to some specific products today. It's important to know that the EU places the greatest responsibility on manufacturers and others in the supply chain to ensure that potentially harmful products don't even reach consumers in the first place. Everyone in the chain of distribution is also responsible for ensuring only safe products are supplied, whether they're importers, distributors or retailers, for example. Of course, increasingly many products are sold online and so extra steps have been introduced. In particular, <clears throat> anyone, <clears throat> anyone selling online must have a representative physically based in the EU to help sort out problems with safety and other important matters should these arise. I mentioned a moment ago about consumer rights. EU consumers have many rights, including a right to truthful advertising, a right to have faulty goods repaired or replaced, and the right to return most goods purchased online within 14 days. However, sometimes things go wrong and consumers are put at risk from dangerous products. Market surveillance officers across the EU can take action to address this situation and ensure that dangerous products are quickly removed from the market. In addition, consumers have rights to various forms of compensation and redress. Many agencies invest a lot of time and effort across the EU to advise and educate consumers of their rights. I'll now pass you back to Gerhard to continue with this webinar. Thank you very much, John. Um, now I have the pleasure to invite two of our senior experts. We have with us Mrs. Geraldine Koch, and Mr. Richard Sargent. 
Both experts have abundant knowledge of the EU product safety requirements and how to understand and apply these rules in practice. I hope you will enjoy the training and it will help you to better understand the EU product safety rules. Thank you very much for being with us today. Dear experts, the floor is yours. Please start your presentation. Thank you, Gerhard, and to all the speakers. I would like to add my welcome to you all for joining our important webinar on children's toys. I am honored to be talking to you today and to be working with the great SPEAK team on these webinars. In today's webinar, Richard and I will walk through some key questions that are asked in relation to toys. We will discuss product safety issues identified in the EU, EU requirements and obligations, and finally, practical solutions. We hope that the webinar will support manufacturers in understanding the complexities of product safety and risk management related to toys sold in the EU. Toys are aimed at young children who are considered vulnerable groups in society. So it is vitally important to ensure their safety. Therefore, manufacturers need to supply safe products for the EU market. The product category of children's toys covers a multitude of products and designs as seen in the slide. These include rattles, slime, putty, and musical instruments. The products in the slide may look fine, but they have a number of safety concerns and were placed on the EU recall and notification database, which is known as the safety gate. The rattle had a choking concern. The putty had a small magnet with a high flux that posed an internal blockage concern. If swallowed, magnets can be very dangerous leading to perforation of the intestines. And finally, the toy on the slide, a referee toy set, had a toy whistle which posed a damage to hearing. The 2021 annual report from the safety gate noted that toys were in the top five products notified on the safety gate. They were the second most common after cars, accounting for 20% of the notifications. If we look at the recent 2022 data, we can see that the top five toys notified were dolls, soft toys, plastic toys such as toy ducks or animal shaped toys, slime and electrical toys. And if we take a look at the risk types for these notifications, the most common were chemicals, including phthalates, flame retardants, boron and nickel. The second most common risk type was choking, followed by multiple risks. Multiple risk types are where more than one risk type was noted, such as both choking, chemical and suffocation all on one product. This was followed by suffocation and finally environmental risks, which includes chemical concerns, specifically those noted under the Roche legislation, which is the restriction of hazardous substances for electrical items. Our first question is, what are the key things I need to know to ensure I can safely supply toys in the EU? Richard, can you help us answer this question? Thank you, Geraldine. There are three main areas I wanted to highlight in answering this broad question. We have the definition of a toy. We have legislation and standards and then manufacturer and producer duties. So let's take a step back. When manufacturing such products, there is a basic question. 
is what I am making a toy? Of course, in many cases, the answer to this will be obvious. There are millions of toys manufactured across the world each year. But what actually is a toy? The EU has defined what it considers a toy in its toy safety directive, as shown on the slide. This is what manufacturers and market surveillance authorities look at when assessing products, either in production or on the marketplace. Some products will overlap the 14 year old threshold, but manufacturers must always go back to this definition when designing goods or producing goods. The definition is important because the Toy Safety Directive only applies to toys. Products which are similar but are not toys are covered by general product safety requirements. There are many pieces of legislation, standards or best practice manufacturers need to know, but I'll hopefully summarise some key areas to consider which will support the production of safe toys to the EU. It is important to have a clear focus, firstly during the design phase of producing toys in order to get things right first time. Then during production, and finally, post-production with sampling and reviewing complaints. Regardless of how it's described, if a product falls into the toy definition, it is a toy. For example, manufacturers cannot label toys for adult use only if it is clearly a toy and needs to be sold as such. So how should a manufacturer approach this? Firstly, look at the play value of the product. Now, virtually everything has play value for a child, but this does not make every object fall into the definition of a toy. Manufacturers must also understand how the toys might be used. Users and third parties must be protected when toys are used as intended or in a foreseeable way, bearing in mind the normal behaviour of children. Manufacturers must assess the final product and make judgments on the toy's usage. For example, would a child put their fingers into a gap in the toy? Would a child put the toy in their mouth. Also, the ability of users must be taken into account, in particular in the case of toys intended for use by children under 36 months. These are very vulnerable groups and the EU requires manufacturers to protect them. Secondly, if items are being sold by retailers in a toy section of a shop or within toy shops, then there is more weight to suggest it is a toy. Practically, this is not in manufacturer's control, unless, for example, you are receiving orders from well-known EU toy retailers. Then the way you package advertise or label a product can also assist you in considering whether or not the item would fall within the EU's definition of a toy. Manufacturers can provide key information to consumers in the form of labels and instructions for use. These will draw the attention of users and supervisors to inherent hazards and risks and how to avoid them. In practical terms, a simple label with a warning can effectively change a toy from one considered to be dangerous to one considered to be safe. So this is important to any manufacturer to consider. 
Now, some items are considered dual function. Therefore, it is vital, for example, you are asked to make a pencil sharpener as per the slide. It will still fall in the toy definition as a child would play with this product. So what else is there for a manufacturer to consider? This slide highlights the particular requirements in legislation. These key risks are covered by toy standards EN71 and EN62115 and are quite precise, but we'll come back to these later. The majority of toys will be covered by the first risk of physical and mechanical properties. However, manufacturers must consider all these risks when designing and manufacturing toys to ensure all risks have been identified and addressed. For example, adding paint to a traditional wooden toy train will result in the chemical risk category needing to be considered. All countries have rules about toy safety. The details may vary, but the objectives are the same. Protecting potentially vulnerable consumers. However, the EU's rules are different in that they not only are about meeting technical safety requirements, they also enable products to freely circulate between the individual EU member states. So it's important to understand this in order to have a more complete understanding as to why certain requirements do exist. One other feature of the EU rules is that the laws themselves are written in fairly general terms. This is the case with the Toy Safety Directive, which is the main legislation for toys in the EU. This enables the laws to be flexible, to meet changes in the market, whether to address changing consumer expectations or new and novel toys. For a manufacturer, this means that much important detail is to be found within the technical standards. The relationship, therefore, between laws and standards is of crucial importance for toy manufacturers. In the EU, the legislation focuses only on what are known as the essential requirements that a toy must achieve. Everything else is left to you as manufacturers to determine. And the detail can be found in what are known as harmonised standards. As a manufacturer, you don't have to follow these standards, but there are benefits in terms of keeping things simple if you do. If you understand the relationship between the laws and these technical standards, you are well on the way to supplying safe products into the EU market which comply with EU requirements. Finally, we have key duties or obligations. Manufacturers or producers play a key role in ensuring the safety of toys. So let's take a look at their main responsibilities. The main obligation of a producer is to supply a safe toy. Whether you produce a wooden toy or a trampoline, they must all be deemed safe when sold in the EU. Basically, they must meet what are those called, those called essential safety requirements. Now these are general risks, the health and safety of children, as well as other people, such as parents or caregivers. And then we have particular risks, which are those physical, mechanical, we've got flammability, chemical, electrical, hygiene, and radioactive risks. Manufacturers must also produce technical documentation and a conformity assessment, which is simply a procedure to demonstrate to the manufacturer 
and market sales officers that the toy does comply. The Declaration of Conformity, or DOC, is a self-issued document that states product compliance with the requirements of the directive. CE marking is mandatory, but it's not just about producing these documents, but there is a requirement to retain them for 10 years. This is very important in case any safety issues arise and information obtained quickly. Next, we have information which can identify the manufacturer, usually the name and address. This is often used for traceability when concerns have been raised about the supply of a dangerous toy. Key instructions and information play a key role in ensuring consumers, i.e. the children with toys, can use the toy safely. This could be warnings or even assembly instructions with say outdoor trampolines. Finally, there is a duty for manufacturers to take action when things go wrong. Market surveillance officers will contact EU importers and be making requests for specific documentation which will be forwarded to any Chinese toy manufacturer. In summary, and in response to this first broad question, the key things you need to know to ensure that you supply safe children's toys to the EU are summarized in the points on the slide. It's a simple philosophy, but I cannot stress the importance of spending time as a manufacturer in getting it right first time. The extra costs in ensuring safety is put first will far outweigh the significant cost of a major international product recall. Before production even commences, it is fundamental to ensure that the specifications are clear on product design and the type of product being produced. Manufacturers must ensure that the toys they put on the market have been designed and manufactured in accordance with the European standards where possible. The approach by Chinese manufacturers must start with their own internal systems, as this is something within their control and to develop. If the EU makes changes to legislation or standards, then Chinese manufacturers have no influence on this and must adapt. However, approaches and checks within the factory are in your power to develop. So what can manufacturers do internally? Firstly, it is all about ensuring raw materials are safe and consistently supplied to the same quality standards set. Manufacturers need to take a proactive stance to assessing compliant raw materials. Are suppliers producing to you materials that are free from defects and free from high levels of dangerous chemicals? Checks will need to be done either at suppliers' factories themselves or through effective quality control checks at your factories. I'd also recommend that manufacturers must focus on good quality control system that ensures production and post-production checks are both stringent and effective. So moving on to the second main question, Geraldine, what technical standards are relevant for toys? Thank you, Richard. Although toy standards are voluntary, on a practical level, I would advise all toy manufacturers to comply with the standards. These are very specific, but if you can demonstrate that your toy meets the standards, 
then the toy is presumed safe. There are two key European toy standards, EN71 and EN62115. EN71 covers all toys. However, if the toy has any electrical components, then the manufacturer will also need to consider EN62115 plus other EU directives such as low voltage. EN62115 provides detailed requirements for electrical toys. If you sell electrical toys, then you need to assess both standards. But if there are no electrical components in the toy, then just EN71 is your focus. When looking at standards, the key chapters and structure rarely change, but updates do occur. And these will often be very specific and detailed. For example, EN62115 was updated in 2020 and has new requirements for new warnings for button and coin batteries, which may be ingested by children. The new requirements should make them less accessible. So let's now take a closer look at the EN71 toy standard. It is quite a detailed set of standards with 14 parts. Although not all these parts will be required, the parts themselves are often updated. So it's worthwhile checking you are aware of the latest requirements applicable for your toy. This check can be very useful, for example, when assessing test certificates from raw material suppliers. If any test certificate highlights an old version of EN71, you should question why this is the case. EN71 covers a wide range of generic areas, such as mechanical and physical properties, flammability and chemical. However, there are some parts which are product specific, for example, part seven on finger paints and part 14 for trampolines. Part one of EN71 is divided into the standard chapters on the slide. As it totals 186 pages, I've picked out the key areas which tend to fail in the EU, which should help everyone today. The fourth chapter specifies the general requirements of toys. It details the requirements for the commonly used components of toys, such as flexible plastic sheeting, glass and expanding materials. It also covers issues for specific toy types, such as mouth actuated toys, enclosures, toys intended to bear the mass of a child, aquatic toys and inflatable toys and so on. The fifth chapter is specifically for toys intended for children under 36 months. This age group is very vulnerable and therefore toys intended for their use have key safety requirements. The sixth chapter is on packaging because the packaging of toys may also be played with by children leading to suffocation or other risks. This part of the standard specifies the thickness, size, and means of closing of the packaging film. The seventh chapter is warnings, markings, and instructions for use. This chapter specifies the contents of warning signs retrospectively. The eighth chapter is the specific test method to allow manufacturers and test laboratories a clear approach to ensure toys are safe. This standard is currently under review, so it's important to review the standard when it's updated. So on to our next question. Richard, can you tell us what technical documents are required for toys? Thank you, Geraldine. We have already highlighted some of the key standards that may be applicable to your products. And if there's a standard for your products, you'll need to test to those requirements in that standard. It is recommended that it is completed at an authorized testing laboratory. 
but you can complete some tests in-house. At the factory, it is worth getting to know what the specific requirements are. And the, these testing details will be an important document to have to hand. So in the EU, many manufacturers are developing and producing technical files for their products. There is a legal obligation to do so for toys under the Toy Safety Directive. And the Toy Safety Directive requires toy manufacturers to draw up the necessary technical documentation and keep it for 10 years after the toy has been placed on the market. The technical documentation must contain the relevant data used by toy manufacturers to ensure compliance, which includes a detailed description of the design and manufacturer, a safety assessment for each toy, a description of the conformity assessment procedure, which can either be self-assessment or third-party assessment, we have test reports and also manufacturer and storage addresses. Our next question is about the CE mark. And we are often asked about the CE mark. So do children's toys produced need to be CE marked? The answer is a simple yes. CE marking is compulsory for products covered by particular directives, such as toys and electrical equipment. It is a set format and design, and so it cannot be varied. It should be affixed to the toy, but where the size or nature of the toy does not allow it, then it can be placed on the packaging or in a document accompanying the toy. As you can see on the slide, the next question is with regards to labelling and warnings. So are there any specific labelling or safety warning requirements? It's important to recognise that the safety of a toy does not solely rest with the actual product itself. Some toys must come with warnings and instructions about precautions that need to be taken to ensure safe use. One example is for toys that are not suitable for children under three. These require a warning to this effect, plus the reason why, for example, a choking hazard. Now this can be in the form of a pictogram, as shown on the slide, or actual words. It is key to note that this symbol should never be found on toys that are suitable for children under three, such as rattles or teethers and uh, soft body toys. There are some specific warnings for certain toys to consider as well, such as swings, skateboards, and toys for use in water. We'll now discuss labelling requirements. The first bullet point is the name and address of the manufacturer. Now this is key for consumers and market surveillance officers who need to be able to identify the producer of any dangerous toy that is supplied into the EU. If the manufacturer is outside of the EU, for example, in China, then the name and address of the manufacturer and the EU importer needs to be displayed. The next point is very important as it can have a significant impact for the manufacturer. Ensuring a type, batch, serial or model number is displayed will help a manufacturer if ever there was a product recall instigated. This identification requirement can potentially reduce the amount of your product 
that needs to be removed from the EU market and ultimately your financial cost. Then we have the CE mark and then packaging information. Now this is often forgotten by manufacturers as they focus on the actual toy safety. However, packaging is a key component of the whole product and must be safe and display the correct warning. Let us now move on to the next question regarding recalls. If a manufacturer does supply a dangerous toy Geraldine, what is the recall process and what can be the consequences? Great question, Richard. Product recalls and corrective actions are important for protecting consumers from dangerous products and may even save lives. Recalls are one of the most common measures to mitigate the risks posed by dangerous products that have already been supplied to consumers. Among the over 2,000 alerts on dangerous products exchanged each year through the EU safety gate, about half concern recalling products from consumers. While response rates vary considerably, depending on factors such as the channel of sale and the product category, the proportion of products successfully recovered from consumers remains generally low. This is because consumers are either not aware that a product they own is being recalled or perhaps they fail to react when seeing a recall announcement. No company likes to take corrective measures, but when a safety problem makes a product recall necessary to prevent injuries and save lives, it benefits both economic operators and consumers to move quickly and effectively. Evidence suggests that consumers' trust in companies can actually increase as a result of a well-managed recall. So what actually is a recall? A recall is any measure aimed at achieving the return of a dangerous product that is already in the hands of consumers or other end users. However, there are different types of recall worth mentioning. Recalls may be undertaken directly by economic operators on a voluntary basis, often as a result of guidance and suggestions provided by market surveillance authorities, also known as MSAs. When the MSA orders the economic operator to initiate a recall, this is considered to be a mandatory recall. In exceptional situations where there may be no other workable option to prevent the risks involved, for example, when the economic operator cannot be identified or perhaps fails to act, the MSA may need to carry out corrective action themselves including recalling the product. Finally, it is important to understand the different terminology to ensure what actions are being requested by an MSA. While a recall aims at achieving the return of a dangerous product from end users, a withdrawal is any measure aimed at preventing a product in the supply chain from being made available on the market. Besides a recall and a withdrawal, other corrective actions can also be taken by economic operators or ordered by authorities. These include marking a product that poses risks in certain conditions with suitable warnings, making the marketing of a product subject to prior conditions in order to make it safe, completely banning the marketing of a product, destroying a product, or technically repairing or amending the product. So let's now explore the actual process briefly. Before we start, manufacturers should plan and be ready for a recall. This could involve a recall strategy and an action plan. The process involves key steps and the seven key stages are on the slide. This will involve carrying out a risk assessment initially. 
then deciding on what kind of corrective action to take. Next is to inform the national MSA of the product risk and planned corrective action. Then it is vital to inform others in the supply chain and relevant further actors, for example, online marketplaces. Then use a variety of communication channels, it can be including direct contact if it's feasible. Online sellers should find this very easy as consumers' contact details, for example, their email, should be known. Next is to perform corrective actions. This is to retrieve the products from the consumers and, if relevant, from the supply chain. Provide remedies and then also deal with the retrieved products. Finally, it is to monitor and review. It is wise to adjust and or continue actions until the corrective actions have been successful. However, although a Chinese manufacturer may avoid the direct legal challenge, the indirect consequences may be more severe. The indirect consequences include seeking compensation, returning products, damaged reputation, the individual business, but also more widely, the importer not wishing to work with the same Chinese business in the future. So let's move on to our next question. More and more sales are happening online these days. Richard, can you tell us about these rules for children's toys manufacturers? Thank you, Geraldine. More and more consumers shop online. The proportion of sales online has been growing compared to the total of sales. As you can see in the slide, global online sales are expected to reach 4.1 trillion dollars by 2027. Online shopping is convenient for consumers, but it also poses certain challenges to product safety. The basic rule is that whatever protection consumers enjoy does not change whether products are purchased in a physical shop or online. Recently, the EU created the Product Safety Pledge. This is a voluntary commitment by online platforms, which goes beyond product safety legal obligations. It contributes to the faster removal of dangerous non-food consumer products offered for sale online and sets out actions by online marketplaces to strengthen product safety, such as providing a clear way for consumers to notify dangerous product listings. These companies include Amazon, eBay, AliExpress, for example, who have given a commitment to take action to keep online shoppers safe from harmful products. Now, e-commerce and off-premises selling offers many advantages, but it also entails certain obligations under EU rules. The EU legislation that covers online selling is the e-commerce directive. Transactions subject to these EU rules are sales of goods and to consumers when you don't meet your customer face to face. For example, contractual agreements over the internet. Now the directive is quite detailed, but it covers pre-contract and post-contract requirements. Businesses selling online goods in the EU must provide certain advanced information to customers, such as your details like identity and your email. It also requires information on delivery and returns, pricing and contractual information. Finally, it covers specific details on areas such as the actual delivery of the goods, 
for example, goods must be supplied within 30 days of the consumer's order. So Geraldine, our next question relates to testing for electrical items. Are there any specific tests for electrical toys? Thank you, Richard. The demand for electronic toys is increasing. With manufacturers worldwide constantly developing new technologies for children to utilize. EN 62115 is the European standard for electrical toys and was recently amended. These types of toys can range from sit on motorcycles to small handheld devices. The standard defines an electric toy as a product having at least one function dependent on electricity. Overall, this standard is very detailed, scientific, and specifies exact testing methods. Therefore, I would recommend any manufacturer has a good understanding of the requirements or consults with a testing laboratory for further support. I wanted to highlight some areas in the standard that have caused some problems with dangerous products in the EU. This is a real life example of a simple but dangerous electric toy. It is a balloon with an LED light. The toy can easily break, causing the button batteries and LED light to become accessible. If a battery is swallowed, particularly a coin cell battery, it can be fatal. As shown on the X-ray on the slide, due to the size of the battery, it is possible for it to become trapped in a very dangerous place. Our bodies are amazing and they are tightly compacted and we manage to fit a lot of vital organs, arteries and body parts in a small space. Here in the chest area is also where the food pipe is and it's where items go when they are swallowed. So in this case, a coin battery, which is very close to our main and largest artery, the aorta. If the battery becomes impacted and does not pass through, a chemical reaction occurs and the battery will burn through the vital body parts in a matter of minutes. Over 60 children around the world have died this way and many more have had life-changing injuries. I cannot stress enough the importance of keeping batteries out of reach of children as much as possible. I think technology has advanced so much and we have some great products that rely on batteries, but we need to ensure that vulnerable consumers are protected by simple measures, such as a tool being required to open the battery compartment. And this is outlined in EN 62115. The next question relates to EC type examination. Richard, can you share some examples of toys that require EC type examination, the circumstances and when this is necessary and the procedures to follow? Thank you, Geraldine. Manufacturers need to conduct a conformity assessment on the toy they produce. This can be a self-assessment by using harmonized standards for toys or by a third party like a notified body. The notified body will examine the toy and produce an EC type examination. So notified bodies perform EC type examinations in cases as specified in the Toy Safety Directive as shown on the slide. Firstly, where harmonised standards covering all relevant safety requirements for the toy do not exist. This may seem unusual, but toy technology changes and so the new toys may have a hazard which is not caught for example, by EN 71. Next is where the manufacturer has not applied them or has applied them only in part. Thirdly, 
is where one or more of the harmonized standards has been published with a restriction. Again, this is not common, but it can happen. And finally, when the manufacturer considers that the nature, design, construction, or purpose of the toy necessitates third party verification. Now this is often when the toy is very new and advanced and potentially something not seen on the toy market before. On this slide, I have highlighted a toy from the 1970s and 80s on the left. When this was produced, it was deemed unique and very advanced technologically. However, when compared with the virtual reality headset on the right, it shows how technology changes and new products are constantly evolving over time. This means that the toy standard often gets updated to catch up with these new designs in toys. In the past, there have been numerous toys that have had an EC type examination. The list includes items such as toy scooters and hazardous magnets in toys. These are not really needed to be EC type examined now as both products are now covered with the EN71 being amended. I've highlighted some current toys that need EC type examination. Firstly, we have inflatable activity toys. EN71 does not fully cover all physical and mechanical hazards of these toys. Next, we have remote controlled toy helicopters. EN71 does not cover specific risks related to remote controlled toy helicopters for children over 12 years old, where the rotor does not have a ring around the perimeter. This entry is only applicable for helicopters for children over 12 years old. The remote control helicopters for children over eight years old are covered in EN71 part one. And finally, we have buried trampolines. These were products that were designed to take up less space than traditional trampolines. Now EN71 part 14 does not cover the specific risks related to buried toy trampolines. After publication of EN71 part 14, which is the part for trampolines, the standards body is working on requirements for buried toy trampolines. Now, our last question relates to how we can make sure a test item is representative of a batch. This is an interesting question as design and production can be fast paced and constantly changing. Good manufacturers are often changing designs or bringing out new models to their range of toys they make. However, there are risks involved with this in terms of safety. Manufacturers need to ensure consistency in production. So any design changes should have been assessed. Will adding small buttons to a teddy bear become a possible small part if detached from the final toy? Will the extra metal tube on a child's ride-on toy become a finger entrapment risk? Raw materials also need to be safe and constant. Have you changed suppliers of paint or adhesive? Do you have test certificates for these raw materials? Do you know the test certificate relates to the product supplied to your factory? We also need to consider quality control to achieve consistency. 
This can be down to regular checks on factory machines, to spot checks on handmade items of the toy. Now these are all key questions to making sure batches are being produced to the same specification over and over again. So thank you very much for listening to our webinar. I'll now hand back to Gerhard. Thank you very much, Richard and uh, Geraldine. Please be prepared to come back to our conference room shortly together with our key expert, John. And I see that now we have also our communication expert, Leo Yan, here. Um, may I say something first, Leo Yan? Um, I have been informed that some of the participants and also of others had some internet connection problems. Uh, everything worked fine on my side. I also know it worked fine on Moodle. And for all those who worry, there is a recording of this webinar and there would be a replay of the uh, webinar possible uh, through the speak website or also through the facilities of HQTS. So don't, don't worry about this. Now, Leo Yan, please introduce our online survey. Everybody who has still access to the internet, I have perfect access to the internet. So I hope you do. Uh, please follow uh, the kind instructions of our communication expert, Liu Yan. Liu Yan, please. Okay, hi.现在由我来给大家介绍如何填写问卷第二步第三步提交问卷以后您会看到所有技术问题的正确答案可以自我评估这次培训的效果最后请关闭问卷窗口回到培训的直播间我们设计这个问卷的初衷主要是为了了解各位对培训内容的接受情况以及专家培训的效果所以特别欢迎大家填写问卷帮助我们不断完善今后
um, I would say, John, uh, um, let's just quickly, even we have already in writing answers and maybe put it a little bit different also to our experts in form of a discussion uh, on, on these very important and very good questions and illustrate a little bit more uh, what is the matter. I think there are some very interesting questions. John, please. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. Um, we, as you say, we've been asked some, um, we've been asked some excellent questions by our um, participants and, um, and uh, Annalisa from DG Grow has very kindly provided some answers in the chat box. But as you say, it'd be helpful just to perhaps explore some of these in more detail, perhaps broaden out some of these questions. Um, perhaps firstly then, um, Richard, uh, around the issue of, of technical files, what are the rules as far as uh, the format in which uh, these technical files, there is something you described during the course of the presentation, but, but do they have to be, are, are we talking about pieces of paper here? Are we talking about something on a computer? What, what are we talking about? Can you, can you give us a bit more information about the, the way in which this information needs to be kept? Yes, thank you, John. It is a good question. I think more and more sort of test certificates, documentation is in electronic form. Uh, there is no requirement to actually have these documents in electronic form. However, what I would say is with modern technology and responses to requests, you may get requests as a manufacturer from your importer um, about test certificates and batch issues. It'd be very useful to have it in electronic form, but there is no legal requirement. It just simplifies the process. If there is an issue in Europe, the market savings authorities have discovered an unsafe toy. Um, the quicker the reaction is and to get the information data can be very helpful for everyone involved in the whole process. So as Annalisa has mentioned, this doesn't have to be in electronic form. It can be in paper form. Although all I'd say is to get the information across to the EU quicker, then electronic form is gonna suffice to get that um, information straight to the market surveillance authority who are investigating these um, dangerous toys. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And um, Geraldine, I know that, you know, yourself and um, Richard during the course of your presentation focused a lot on um, regulations and standards and the importance of, of uh, uh, keeping up to date with these because of course they can and do uh, change over time for all the reasons that you um, explained to us today. But what are the best ways that you would advise a manufacturer for, for being able to, to keep on top of these changes? Uh, have you got any advice around that? Yeah, and, and the link's been put in the chat um, by, by Annalisa. So thank you for doing that. And I would definitely follow the European Commission website. There's some really great information on there and they have information when standards and legislation get updated. Uh, and you can join mailing lists for various organisations, uh, testing laboratories, etc. And they quite often send alerts out. You know, working with your partners in the industry, I think, is a really good way of doing that as well. If, if you do multiple ways, then you're less likely to miss something. That, that's what I would recommend. OK, great. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, 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 Geraldine. <clears throat> and we've got another um, question. Um, uh, and Richard, I'll perhaps direct this towards yourself. The question, actually, the, the one, one that I want to focus on, because it is a question that we do, uh, that, that we do get frequently. The question is, should all kinds of children's toys have a children's uh, product certificate? And I, and I think one of the issues here that we see quite frequently, isn't it, is that um, in other parts of the world, there, there, is, there are ideas around having to have approvals for things and, and, and certificates and, uh, and that sort of thing before a product can be placed on the market. And the CE mark can look like some sort of award, award that is made by a third party or, or another body. I wonder if you could just generally um, 
describe, I know you, you talked about the CE mark during a presentation and the fact that it's the manufacturer that puts it on there, but just to clarify this point about the nature of the CE mark and who is responsible for, uh, for a, you know, putting it on the product. Can you just say something a little bit more about that, that whole issue, uh, Richard? Yeah, thank you, John. The, the CE mark is very important. Um, the, the key legislation um, is a toy safety directive today, and that will specify that all toys supplied to the EU must have a CE mark on them. So then that responsibility gets transferred to the producer, the manufacturer of the toy. So wherever the manufacturer is based, whether it's in the EU or China, anywhere in the world, any incoming toys into the EU and sold in the EU must have this CE mark. The CE mark um, is something which the manufacturer is going to be placing on the product and they're basically saying that this product is a safe toy. Now there's all the technical documentation behind all that to support that statement. So they will have this technical file, which I mentioned earlier with all the key documentation on it. But the reason also behind the CE mark is that product can then freely circulate around the EU. So if it goes imported into Germany and then gets sold into Italy, then the market surveillance authorities are content that that product should be safe. It's got the CE mark on it and all the correct labeling on it. So therefore it can go from one country to another. So there's no this restrictions at borders. The EU is one market in the sense that those goods with a CE mark on them can then freely circulate around each country. Um, it, it helps everyone really. It helps consumers, it helps businesses. And so that's the, the key requirements of the um, CE mark. Okay, thank, thanks Richard. And so I, I think to be clear here, what we're saying is that the manufacturer isn't applying to a third party for the award of the CE mark. It's, it's the manufacturer isn't buying this, this, uh, this mark. It's not that kind of product. It is the manufacturer who has to ensure his products comply with all the various rules and requirements and in doing so is then entitled and in fact must uh, mark his products where, where it's required, must mark his products with a CE mark. I think that that's the, probably the point that we would want to get across, Richard. Is that right? Yes, totally. We, you know, in, in the Toy Safety Directive, you, you cannot um, go to a test laboratory, for example, and, and pay for a CE testing certificate for your toy. It's all done. Responsibility is yours. You have to make sure the product you sell is safe, basically. You're basically looking at this product, you're manufacturing it, designing it, and clearly saying, this is a safe toy because I've done all my tests, I've done all my checks, and therefore I, as a manufacturer, are going to CE mark this product as required by the Toy Safety Directive, and I'm the one who's responsible for that toy. And so, yeah, the CE marking is fully responsibility lies with the producer or manufacturer. Yeah, thanks, Richard. I think you've sort of made the point there, uh, Richard, about the use of the um, about about the use of a, a test laboratory, uh, and that the test laboratory, you know, it, they are also not awarding these CE um, CE marks in that in that sense. But uh, but I think Geraldine, you did make the point about the importance of test laboratories and the role that they can perform in the if you like the whole process, and perhaps. Um, Geraldine, you might just want to say something about the, the use of the test uh, laboratory to support a manufacturer, even in circumstances where it may not be, uh, if you like, le a legal requirement to do so. Nevertheless, I think we would very often say there is value in that, and, and you might want to uh, say a bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. I, I spent the majority of my career actually at a testing laboratory, and I think the advice that they can give with regards to testing, you know, sometimes maybe your product is unique um, and the legislation can't quite, you know, keep up with that. There may be other standards that are really useful. And I think 
it is invaluable having a conversation with your laboratory and having a partnership with your laboratory to to query what testing is applicable for your toys you know what's the most appropriate and fundamentally to keep the product safe that's what we all want to do so and they're really really useful very very intelligent educated people that can definitely support you Great. And, and actually, we've got a question specifically around uh, this, the uh, standards for testing heavy metals, and that may be something that a manufacturer may not be able to do themselves. The question is, what, what tests uh, should be done for, for heavy metals? Can you, can you give us some advice on that, Geraldine? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's clearly laid out in the Toy Safety Directive in, in one of the annexes, I believe. There's specific requirements and throughout the Toy Safety Directive on, on chemicals. And then also in EN 71 part three, see that someone's noted that's for all ages. That's not just for under three. So that, that most certainly is if, if it's for toys that are, you know, eight, nine years old intended for that age group, it, it's still applicable. Um, and then definitely you need to look at the, the reach legislation. So any other chemical legislation. And as mentioned in the slide, you know, if it's electrical, then you have Roche legislation. I know it, it can be some for some people a little bit overwhelming, but the European Commission website is really nice and succinct and gives you the details. And again, you can always send your sample to the laboratory and say which testing is applicable for this product for the EU market. And they'll let you know. But the equipment is very advanced, uh, expensive equipment um, that is highly unlikely to be at some factories, but maybe. So you need a laboratory to actually do that testing for you. Okay, that's great and that's clear. Thanks very much. And perhaps if I could just return to this, this point, uh, which is we, we understand can be challenging for, for uh, many businesses, and that's sort of keeping up to date with the standards and the, and the rules and regulations and, and the things change. And of course, we recognise that many manufacturers are not just selling into the EU market, but they've got to do this for all the other markets that they uh, they, they sell it into as well. Uh, but, but Richard, the specific question we've, we've been asked is that if a product's been shipped to the, the EU market, but, but the standards are, are updated afterwards, will the products then be uh, withdrawn or recalled? How, how does the EU deal with that situation where, you know, products in the supply chain might have met previous requirements, but then, uh, you know, those requirements change? How's that dealt with, Richard? Yeah, it's a good question because standards do change naturally. Well, I've talked about it during the presentation. Things happen and uh, different products change. What Just because a standard changes though, it doesn't mean your toy becomes unsafe. The standard may be applicable, maybe changing, um, for example, I talked about buried uh, trampolines. So if the standard changes to accommodate the buried trampolines requirements and you sell teddy bears, then just because a standard changes, it doesn't make the toy unsafe. So we have to be very clear. Um, if a standard changes, whether it's EN71 or the electrical standard, you know, what are the changes, first of all, that have taken place and therefore does it affect my product? So that's the first question we need to look at and address. If the question actually says, well, yeah, actually it does affect my um, product, we need to then look at um, the actual supply. So is it actually on the marketplace anyway? So if it hasn't actually um, been supplied, then there could be an argument there for, depends on what standards have changed. If it's a labeling requirement, so there could be a slight change to um, a requirement to have a particular toy with a key label added, then this could still be done before it actually enters the marketplace. So the importer can liaise with the manufacturer and it's not changing, for example, um, we talked about chemical testing earlier. It's not like a fundamental testing to test whether this product does comply or not. It was a simple labeling um, change then the a label could be added onto that toy, for example. So it is, it's a difficult question to fully answer, but it depends on loads of different factors of what the standard has changed. Does it really affect my toy? How much does it affect my toy? To then address whether it can be fixed or not fixed in terms of, is it a safe toy or not? 
So there's lots of inputs that have to be addressed first in relation to that question to then really for a manufacturer to make changes if needed. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks, Richard. That's, um, that's given us some, certainly given us all something to, to think about. Um, we, we have got, there are some other questions uh, and I'll be handing back to Gerhard in just a moment because, and I'm sure he will explain about where further information is available and uh, information that we haven't been able to respond to um, today where that information uh, would be would be found. So I'm just going to stop now and say thank you very much to Geraldine and, and Richard for helping us with the, uh, the questions that we've we've put to them. And I will now pass back to Gerhard. Thank you very much, uh, Tom and Geraldine and Richard, uh, again for the presentation and for answering the question. Also, our thanks go to Annalisa from DG Grove for writing answers. Um, and um, so what uh, John has already announced is that there is the Speak Project. And the Speak Project has a website. On, on this website, we have, for example, a section, Frequently Asked Questions. Some of the questions, what you have just posted today, are already answered on the Speak website, amongst many others. Then we have the possibility, you have the possibility to watch the recording of this webinar today. Again, you can just visit our Speak Project website. The, you can follow us also on WeChat, um, where you will get notification of anything new on Speak materials. So we are not entertaining, but we are giving you really practical information. If there is an upcoming webinar, um, is there something new on the Speak website? For example, we have also an, uh, plenty of knowledge videos which explain these questions, what we have discussed briefly today, for example, about the CE mark in very good detail. So everybody knows after watching our videos, how to do with the CE market, what it means. Um, please, can I have the next slide? Um, I would also say that there are a number of supporting organizations here who have supported also this webinar. And you see here right at the top, the logo of HQTS. I want to thank again HQTS for having this webinar with us today. We talked a lot about testing, inspection, etc. Today. So this is, for example, one of the good addresses in China to go if you want to have get help on these matters. Uh, next slide, please. So we have talked before about certifi certificates and PPT. So you have still the opportunity to answer the online survey, uh, which is the avenue to receive the certificate and the PPT. And then you find here also a picture of a calendar a speak event calendar. Again, you visit just our speak website and you can see what is coming up next. Yeah, with this, um, we are almost at the end of our webinar. Uh, here is also the, the, the QR code of HQTS if you have any question in relation to testing, but of course you can also other companies. Um, and uh, But uh, this is something what we can give you uh, on your way home. Um, there is a lot of information on the Speak website again. Uh, please visit the website. Please stay in contact uh, with the professionals. Talk to your colleagues. Share what you have learned today also with your colleagues. Make the product safe. It is the benefit of the children, but of course, you will save a lot of troubles for yourself if you do it right from the beginning. Uh, with this, we are coming to the end. I want to thank again our experts, all of you who have participated today, who have listened, you have shown interest in product safety, and I hope this will help also uh, in everybody uh, in the supply chain. I want to thank our interpreters. I want to thank my team behind the scenes. I want to thank also particularly Liu Yan, Helen, uh, Bai Yu, and all the others who have made this happen. Again, thanks to HQTS for doing this together with us. It is a real pleasure. 
thank you, thank you very, very much.